This week on the Back Table Podcast. Even though TV and radio may seem old fashioned, they are still using all the modern analytics that anyone is, right? And so they can sit there and tell you who's listening, who's watching, and when. So, for example, one of the reasons we went with the radio station we did is that they said at any given point, There's 300,000 people listening to their station during the day. And so we knew that throughout the day, they've got a ton of people listening at any given time. And they say that spikes up during these hours. And so we're going to blast you guys during the morning drive and then on their drive home as well. So they'll say, well, we have airplay at certain gyms and things like that. And so they, they help out with that sort of thing. TV has more fluctuation on cost than radio does. But also, if you have an, a locally owned radio and you're a medical practice, they get super excited about working with you. So they... They want you there because they're looking for a long-term partner. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. This discussion is supported by Philips OBL and ASC Solutions Symphony Suite the industry leader in opening cardiovascular office-based labs and ambulatory surgery centers. With the convenience of a single trusted point of contact, they offer more of what you need to turn your passion into reality, including a full range of high-performing, highly specialized equipment and services, devices, financial options, site planning, guidance on construction partnerships, and more. When it comes to opening an OBL or ASC, Symphony Suite delivers convenience and support as the expert you need, the partner you trust. To learn more, Visit philips.com slash symphony suite. Now, back to the episode. Been looking forward to today's interview with fellow IR Aaron Kovaleski. Aaron is founder of Endovascular Consultants of Colorado. Uh, he's got his own shop and uh, been out in practice for a little while, so he's going to share some of his marketing se- secrets. We're going to talk more about good old-fashioned radio and television, which Aaron has been successful at. Recently, we've, we've covered digital marketing strategies with Eric DePappas and others, but we're going to kind of, you know, jump into some tried and true marketing strategies with Aaron. Welcome, Aaron, to the show. What's up, Aaron? How are you doing, man? Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, man. It was, you know, just some background for the audience. Aaron and I connected recently, and we were talking on the phone, and he was telling me about how much he uses radio and, and television, and I, I you know... I know of some people that have been successful in the Dallas area, but honestly, everybody's so all about SEO and digital marketing these days. You you don't hear people really push for radio and, um, and television. Granted, it, it may only work for certain procedures, and we're going to jump into that. But before yep. we do, tell us tell, tell the audience a little bit about your background, where you were in your career when you started your first OB, your your own OBL. Yeah, so I. I bounced around a little bit. I joined a vascular surgery group out of training down in Florida, and they had two or three OBLs kind of along the panhandle to an outpatient, mostly inpatient, but some outpatient IR. Uh, moved to join a big diagnostic radiology group in uh, Richmond, Virginia, um, and that was more hospital-based, kind of your standard take and call, covering numerous hospitals. Then I came out to Denver, Colorado to join a 100% IR group, um, was with them for a short time, and then at that point, um, I really wanted to work in the outpatient space uh, and, you know, kind of wanted to be my own boss. So open opened my own place and um, I had another doc that joined me a couple months after we had opened. Um, he and I had been talking about it for for a little bit and then uh, opened it up and we were full go with two docs by April of 2020. And I, I had opened it up in January of 2020 and uh, it's been three and a half years ago now. So doing doing great. It's certainly you know, got to be busier than I thought it was ever going to be. And so we've been fortunate to expand to two procedure rooms with a fixed unit. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's just still just the two of you? It's just the two of us. We've added some nurse practitioners and that's pretty much it. So we have three total practitioners in the office. Okay, fantastic. Um, And so tell us the variety of procedures that you guys are doing in your OBL. So we... Really, are just doing what I would call the quote unquote bigger OBL procedures. So your standard PAD cases, which are always going to be a backbone for for any IR practice or for any OBL practice. Um, then uterine fibroid embolization. You're going to have your your venous stuff, the superficial veins, uh, chronic DVT recans, Mayther stent placement, 
gonadal vein embolization, things like that. But then also we have a really busy uh, prostate artery embolization practice. We do genicular artery embolization. And then we also have uh, all of the all of the stuff to do Y90 here. So we do quite a bit of outpatient Y90 with gamma camera and all that stuff. Oh, wow. So you got the hot lab and everything? Got the whole deal, my friend. When did you get that set up and how long did it take to get all that set up? So that was one of those things that I had started working on actually before we opened. So I was able to, golly, I think we did our first Y90 dose in uh, May or June of 2020. We had this little 2200 square foot space and we essentially converted a closet into a hot lab. Wow. And actually got a an exemption, or not an exemption, but an exception made from the radioactive materials uh, licensing company, the NRC, to do a virtual walkthrough to get our RAM license. So I'm just like sitting there holding my phone on FaceTime, walking them around the clinic and showing them everything. And so we were able to get the RAM license and move forward. It was great. That's amazing, man. Yeah, because, you know, you hear about a lot of people going through the process. It, you know, it depends on the state, obviously, but did, was it especially challenging in Colorado or easy relative to others that you've heard? Yeah, if you do, we were pretty stringent. I mean, we 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 certainly got a medical physicist on board right away because they'll they'll walk you through what you need to get your license. And they'll make certain it's all there because they've they've gotten every single hospital certified and licensed and everything else. So they they know exactly what what it is you need to do and how to do it. Um, so we certainly had some help from from our local medical physicist for sure. Yeah. Well, Y ninety is probably not one of the procedures that you're marketing on tell. Well, maybe on television, but tell us about the procedures that, of the ones you just listed that you are really had success in marketing on both television and radio and you start with one or the other yeah so i mean we've and we can get into this more a little bit later but we always start off trying to market everything right and and you try to see what works and and what doesn't and you know at least for the market that we're in and it makes sense the procedures that like for prostates urologists for the most part are not going to refer out a patient with bph for a pae because they're losing money right and now you've got these urology groups that have been bought up by equity firms that are including OBLs. And now all of a sudden urologists are referring for PAEs because they can make some some cash off of it because they own the OBL. We don't have that here in town just yet. And so we have to direct market to patients. And so I would say almost 70% of the prostates that we do are self-referred by something that they saw on TV. And then, I mean, on the flip side in, in women, fibroids, you know, OBs are going to hold on, especially in this market, because if you're in the Southeast, there's enough fibroids for everyone, right? OBs, IR, everyone because of population, socioeconomic status, things like that. In Denver, um, it's not going to be as much. And so OBs are going to hold on to those and they're never going to refer out. And so we've, we discovered that radio for fibroids was a boon, but it's the, then you got to get into which radio station you're doing and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then, so, so it sounds like Primarily prostate with TV, fibroids with mm-hmm. radio. For us, yeah. For you guys. Anything else that you've seen work on TV? So fibroids will work to an extent on TV, but it's demographic. Older folks, and in particular men, are going to sit there and be glued to the TV a little bit more than women. Women are going to be kind of out and about listening to the radio, which was surprising to us to discover that, and not even like, streaming services. I mean, they're listening to old school FM, AM radio, uh, cause we tried all the other stuff and people don't respond to the ads as much on, on streaming services as they do for just regular old broadcast radio. Um, and that's, and it's, I mean, five words are a younger demographic. It's, it's women in their twenties to, to early fifties. And so they're, they're coming in listening to broadcast radio. Do you think it's just a, maybe that's the numbers game? Like there's enough people still listening to just old school radio that versus like the streaming is a little bit more niche, I guess, depending on what you're on. Yeah. And people are doing streaming because they don't want to listen to advertisements. Right. And so you're, you're paying money to not listen to advertisements a lot of times. So people will get the, the more expensive plan and not listen to it, but also too, it's kind of what you do. I mean, the, the radio station that we went through a couple of things, it was locally owned. It's not with iHeartRadio, which is going to be that national thing that they, they don't, I heard radio is not going to care about local businesses advertising, right? They want right. huge national Big companies like 
Chevy, yeah. Frito Lay, all that State stuff. State Farm. So, yeah. State Farm. Yeah. So that, that if you go with those, if you go with an iHeart, a station that's owned by iHeart Radio, it's worthless as far as getting local traffic. But if you go with the locally owned radio station, especially one that's super active, and we found that the, the hip hop R&B stations are super active in the community and they only do advertising from local stuff. Um, and so for them, they were very excited because, you know, they're marketing to, you know, to, to racial minorities that are for the most part, not going to have as much access to, to healthcare and, you know, say wherever, you know, and so they, uh, they love it. And so they are super active. They throw concerts, they do, you know, things that like lakes and reservoirs. And so we get to sponsor those things and go to them as well. Uh, which is another thing, because even though you're doing marketing, whether or not it's digital, whether or not it's radio, whether or not it's TV, you still need to go, you know, you're, you still, you, you still, you're still the face of your practice. You still need to go to these events. You still got to shake hands, but it's a little bit different because you're shaking hands with patients instead of referring docs. Yeah. When I was in an OBL setting, I did a couple of health fairs and I mean that, that FaceTime with patients does go a long way. Just them being able to ask you a question right there at the fair or any kind of event, it, they're more likely to, to actually give you a phone call the next day. But, uh, but yeah, it sounds like, so prostate TV. So tell us about getting on TV, like what, cause radio sounds like something you pay for TV. Whenever I see a doc on there, I'm like, did, is this a health segment that the, they invited the doc on because they're an expert or is this something that the doc paid for to be on? So we do paid advertising usually you need a connection to get like a story done or something like that. But there's, there's lots of cost effective ways to get on TV. We ended up using a, an experienced third party medical marketing consultant who had been in the industry for 30 plus years. And he was actually a, a former patient of ours that had had a procedure, got an unbelievable result. And he said, I've never heard of you guys. Like I've never heard of your field. I've never heard of this. He's like, we got to get, he was actually retired. And so now he's not because, because he's back with us and we keep him busy. But, um, he understood going and negotiating a contract. He also understood that, you know, we were just getting going, we didn't have funds. And so he, he was able to spin it, you know, to a lot of these people like, Hey, these guys have this, these revolutionary treatments that you guys don't know about. No one knows about, and we got to help them out. And when you kind of spin it as, as if, you know, it is marketing, but when you spin it to these networks as if they are doing a social service for the community, they're to, especially with that first contract, they're a lot more friendly where they'll either A, throw in a lot more free commercials to get the word out to help you build your brand, or they'll just give you a more cost-effective contract. Yeah. So like how much should a doc, and we don't have to talk about dollar amounts, but like in terms of marketing spend, maybe percentage of marketing spend, when you look at your SEO, your social media marketing your other your your other avenues what percentage are you putting into radio and television so i would say for all marketing in a practice 7 to 10% of your overall budget should be there so if you have let's just say it's a million dollar budget for the year you know you you, sh you should have 7 to 10% of that should be website seo tv radio everything and then of the overall budget breakdown when you start looking at what should be TV and radio, our marketing budget is a 60 is 60% 60 TV and radio. And that's split evenly. So 30% goes to TV, 30% goes to radio. And then 30% of our overall budgets on digital marketing, like AdWords, display ads, YouTube, social media, our blog, and then another 5%, maybe a little bit less, maybe more like 3% is more on SEO but that's also just kind of included in our monthly web maintenance cost. And then we have another five, three to 5% based on just the PR, like press releases, things like that. Uh, and then we do direct mailing as well, um, which is cheap, but it works. Yeah. When yeah. you said people are still checking the mail, right? They're still seeing your face on those flyers. Coupon cutters, man. They, they still need to go to doctors. <laughs> right. Is it labor intensive in terms of like production and preparation, you know, to put these ads together? So yes and no. And I'm a very hands-on guy, right? So I, I probably am more labor intense than maybe a lot of other docs that say, I just want to be a doctor. So when we brought on our, our third-party consultant, Lou, Lou Pincus, um, he's got Target Consulting. 
so that we have two docs in my practice. I'm the one that really likes to be involved in everything and get everything going. And then the other one just wants to be in the procedure room, right? So there's a lot more activity on my end, but that's kind of voluntary. I mean, I think if I would let Lou do everything, he absolutely would. Sometimes I feel like I kind of come in and screw it up because I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just like, no, let's do this. But, um, you know, so if you get someone like Lou, he'll do everything, um, but that's going to be his experience. And he also did some really cool stuff that I didn't even, I mean, it's things you don't think about. You're talking about production of a television commercial. When he's negotiating the contract, he says, oh, and just so we're clear, this includes all production costs for all of the commercials. And you guys are bringing a team out to any location that we say you're going to set up, you're going to do everything. The docs are just going to show up, do their part, and they're going to leave. And then you guys are going to do everything afterwards. So if it's done right by someone that knows what they're doing, then you, it can be pretty easy on him. But to be honest, sometimes it's, some of that stuff's fun, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It can be fun if they allow you to be at fun, you know, if the, if it's allowed to be fun, right? Because otherwise, I think the energy is easily perceived, whether like you're just up there saying, a, uh, you know, retelling a script, uh, reading a script, or just if you're like naturally like excited about what you do, that energy comes through. And part of that is just having fun while you're doing it. Yeah, part of it, so it's part of the negotiation. Like I always am aware, like we always, for the podcast, we're kind of always aware of we have the analytics to show like what time of day people are listening to the podcast. Usually it's in the mornings because they're on their commutes and listening to it first thing in their commutes. And that's, that's why we release it first thing in the morning. Do you, do you guys get those kind of analytics as to when people are consuming? And also I imagine, do you have to pay a premium for certain times of the day, whether it be radio or television? Yeah. So price, price will vary based on time for the most part certainly more so in television and there's may not necessarily be time of the day there's is going to be what time of year it is right you know if it's if it's an election year you, you ain't getting airtime on tv you know i mean those major networks i mean 80 percent of their marketing during an election year is politics so they are really they are really worried about some local station uh, or some local uh, company but as far as timing with great about technology and even though tv and radio may seem old-fashioned they are still using all the modern analytics that anyone is right and so they can sit there and tell you who's listening who's watching and when so for example one of the reasons we want the radio station we did is that they said at any given point there's three hundred thousand people listening to their station during the day and so we knew that throughout the day They've got a ton of people listening at any given time. And they say that spikes up during these hours. And so we're going to blast you guys during the morning drive, just like you said, uh, for the podcast. We're going to blast you at lunch because people go on their lunch break and they're in their car going to get, you know, Chick-fil-A, which is delicious. I'm not paid by Chick-fil-A, but I should be. Um, and then uh, and then uh, or and then on their drive home as well. So they also, you know, they, they'll say, well, we have airplay at certain gyms and things like that. And so they, they help out with that sort of thing. So yeah, they've, they've got analytics just like everyone else. They know when to do it. TV has more fluctuation on cost than radio does, but also if you have an, a locally owned radio and you're a medical practice, they get super excited about working with you. So they, they want you there because they're looking for a long-term partner. I always kind of curious how they get those analytics because like it's, it's public, like radio, television, like how do they know who's listening at, you know I mean? I, like, I understand they know when people are listening, but how they know yep. who's listening. So they all have a website and they all, you can listen to all of their music on their website. Okay. Right? So, so when, using when IP work, addresses. Yep. So you can use IP addresses. They, they know how many cars have it on. Um, and so that's, they, they know who's uh, not necessarily who, but they know where, where the listenership is as well. But then also, at least from our end, as far as analytics go, they have all those call-in things. You know, they're giving away free tickets. Call-in things, while they are to give away free tickets, that's also to get information. That's data. And so they're getting all these phone numbers coming in and they're finding it. You can find out where those people live, the address associated, or at least the zip code associated with it. So they're able to get a lot of information from those call-in things or, hey, log in or send us an email, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. TV is a little bit easier because you're cable. If you're doing network, yeah, it's cable. Yeah, they they know they know your they know which homes are playing it. Interesting. Okay, so I also curious, like, have you? So it sounds like you're doing well with the radio and television for those particular procedures. Any bad marketing investments or or pitfalls over the years that you could share with us that have not gone well? Man, 
So I, I think one of the things that is a little bit different for me from most other docs is that I'm not afraid to quote unquote, lose money on marketing just because I believe that the information you gain from it is actually priceless. So I also don't do it for a year. I I've got a, a rule with Lou that we're doing 90 days. Right. And so that gives you enough time to establish a brand and track it. But then, you know, just to reallocate that money somewhere else. So marketing throughout the year, it's not like you just set it and forget it. You know, there's monitoring, there's analyzing it and then reallocating that budget, whatever percent you set aside into the stuff that works. So, you know, we did television for PAD that did not work at all. We did it on radio and that worked. Um, and so you try it on TV for a little bit. It didn't work. There's all these other, uh, streaming TV services. We tried that at least for us that did not work. Like Pluto and those sorts of things. Yeah. Pluto, but also, you know, like, uh, like CBS has a streaming service platform, right? And so they can push you out to all of that stuff and you get on a lot more channels than just CBS, right? So you're like, oh, now I'm on the golf channel. I'm on this, this is going to work. And it really didn't because the measurement of success for us is how many procedures does it put on the table? And then the measurement of success for them is impressions, right? They're like, oh, we got 10,000 impressions. I mean, impressions are worthless in the OBL world because it doesn't generate revenue, right? And it's, it's good early on to build a brand, which is really important, but you got to get patience on the table. Yeah. Is there, is there a way that you track all this? Like, um, do you have a person in charge of it or are you doing it yourself? Like, how are you tracking the ROI on these things? Yeah. So there's so many ways you can do it. And I don't want to keep sounding like I'm pitching other people, but you know, the, our, our website company is, is really heavily involved with this stuff because when you do radio and television marketing, it's going to increase your traffic significantly to the website, right? So we, we have the, those links that we put up on a television commercial, you know, that is, that is a dedicated one just for that specific radio commercial or that specific television commercial. So when they log in there, we know where they got that, that URL from. For radio, we have a phone number that's just specific to that commercial on radio. So that way we can track it that way. And then also to our, our front desk, whenever anyone calls to uh, set up self-referred consultation, we use eClinical Works. We have an encounter set up for, did you hear, hear about us on radio? Did you hear about us on a website? Like, how do you get it? So every patient is tracked from how they got to us in the first place. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean, that's really important. I was talking to, to Papas about that, how it's you basically need like a CRM for your marketing strategies so that you can just track these things uh, because otherwise, yeah, you don't you don't know. And then people are just telling you, oh yeah, we're, you may be throwing money away and it, it's it's tricky, but somebody's going to be accountable for that dollar, sp- that, that marketing spend. And so you're busy with clinical practice and we talked about the breakdown in terms of money spend, dollar spend, but what's your time spend on marketing? Because I think that's also challenging, especially for docs new coming out. Yeah, I, I would say that on the front end, you spend a lot of time. And then, you know, again, if you're going to do it by yourself, I would, I mean, if you're, a little, if you're doing it by yourself without a, a, another person helping you, like like my, my Lou, you're going to be, I mean, two full days a week. And you're, you're just, if you're going to use your weekends to do that, you could do that. The way I've done it now is now that we've been up and running for a while, you know, my practice manager, she does weekly meetings with our website company. And then I do, I meet with uh, our marketing guy every other week and we do about a 30 minute conversation uh, every other week. And then we have a monthly meeting with our marketing guy to go through how things are tracking. If we need to reallocate money every quarter is when we make decisions. And that's when we have a big roundup with our website folks, Lou, practice manager, me, and we kind of go through how everything's doing and what we need to change up. So once you're going, I would say every quarter, total of maybe 10 hours, maybe 10 hours a month, maybe once you're up and going on the front end. I mean, that's, that's a lot of work, especially if you're doing it by yourself. That's, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, it, but I mean, you, you know, a lot of people are bootstrapping in the beginning. You can't hire, you know, you don't have, you can't afford a marketing person. So you got to learn this stuff, you know, uh, it's part of it. And so, you know, what, what did, what it would be your advice for somebody who's new, who's like, wants to find their version of Lou, like, how do you find that person? Yeah. How do you, 
where do you start? So to me, if, if I'm, if I had to create like a scale, you know, of, of how, how to do a scaled marketing, uh, program for, for a new OBL, or even one that's just wanting to start adding it in is you, you have to start with website. Um, and that's, that's non-negotiable. If you don't have a good website for patients to go and get content and all that other stuff, I mean, it doesn't matter. You can do all this other advertising in the world. Patients need to know where you're located, you know, all, all of these, these other things. And if you're not searchable, I mean, with the way today's, today's society is, if you're not searchable, it means that you're not good at what you do, right? You know, if you're not, if you're not on that front page, if you're not in the top five, then more than likely you're going to lose some business. So SEO website are super important early on. And those are expenses that I, I don't think that you can do without and be successful long-term, right? Yeah, and then also early on, I mean, the, the boots on the ground thing is important. I mean, and so certainly more early on getting out there, meeting, referring docs. I mean, I was the guy that if I didn't have procedures scheduled, I mean, I would just go wait in waiting rooms until someone would see me and I just wouldn't leave. And they'd be like, well, he can't see today. I was like, well, he's got to walk out at some point, you know, <laughs> so he's, gonna, he's gonna, he's going to his car at some point. Yeah. Um, and then I'll, is there a back door here? Um, that's not true. I never, I never did that, but yeah, so it's, that's the early stuff and that's not going to be as expensive. Now, which website company, you know, we, I, I think we went through three or four and I spent 60 grand or 70 grand before we got to a website company that was useful and good. So please, please screen your website companies. And for the love of Moses, if you go through those ones that are like, oh, $5,000 a month, we're going to this, do not, I mean, fi find an hourly company. That's, that's, that's where you can save money and get better results. But yeah, I think early on digital stuff is super important early on to make your, your brand note online. And then I think you add in all this other stuff later because it's going to direct all of this traffic to your digital marketing that you've been doing. Um, and that's when people are going to look for you on Twitter and LinkedIn and all this other stuff. So the digital stuff, I don't think this is a replacement for it. To me, it's all one big package together. Yeah. So like, that's good advice for getting started. What's your vision for the future of marketing for OBLs? Do you think, I mean, it sounds like you think TV and radio is a good investment, probably for years to come. Nobody's going to stop listening to the radio or watching TV. Anything else that you think is on the horizon or that you're dabbling with right now that we could do a round two at some point on? Yeah. There's an old saying, I don't remember what, what this is from. It may have been from like World War II, but it's, it's he or she who owns the airwaves controls the markets, you know? And so at least for right now, you know, we're, we're treating people that didn't grow up with internet, right? You know, and so they're, they're still getting all of their information from standard sources. I mean, sure, they're going to get some stuff from Facebook and, and stuff like that. But in my opinion, we, we do social media marketing. I'm not saying that we don't but it is so saturated with ads. And, and one of the things that happens there is you don't actually get to control your message. A lot of times on social media, it just takes one person going and leaving a negative comment on that ad and your host, maybe for an entire marketing campaign, if they've got like a bunch of followers, you know, with radio and TV, eight comments can't be made, right? It's, it's, that's that you can't, it's not like someone's calling an ad, like to speak after that ad. So you, you do get to control that narrative a little bit better. So I think for right now with the, age of the people that we are mostly marketing to, which are a little bit older. I think that's safe. I do think that there's going to have to be with all of these ZocDoc things and all of these other, um, scheduling stuff. I think that advertising on those eventually is going to be maybe one of the most important platforms because people are going to be going on there to schedule an appointment. And then if they're going to, they, they're not going to know who's better. And so whoever, again, if you control the airwaves on an app like that, you're going to control that market. So yeah, I think that's kind of where it's going is just the, the digital based physician specific apps. Yeah. All right. Well, solid. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, appreciate all your Intel. So if you're interested, look up Aaron Kovaleski on LinkedIn, shoot him a message. He'll get back to you. And you know, one of the, one of the things that's pretty exciting about, uh, the field we're in and the type of practice we're in is we have the, the OEIS, uh, outpatient endovascular and interventional society, which is which has been a huge proponent of, you know, what I do and what we all do. And, and, uh, they're actually adding at this conference, their next conference, which is in March or April of this next year, they're doing a dedicated marketing section, you know, in the past, they really focused on, you know, procedural techniques, et cetera. And they have 
uh, maybe an occasional marketing talk, but now they're doing a dedicated section on practice building and marketing and, and I'll be uh, moderating that as well. And just kind of going through marketing from step one to what I would call advanced, advanced marketing for an established practice. So excited to be a part of that. And then, um, there's, uh, another person that could be doing it with me and Diane Keen, who's normally doing the marketing talks at OAIS. And, uh, she's, she and I are going to work on, on making this exceedingly useful and, and hopefully well attended for those that are trying to build up their practice. Perfect. Yeah. Looking forward to that. OAS is always great. Highly recommend that conference. Lots of great people awesome. there. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. Well, thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sublit. Administrative support provided by Jim Lui Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 